Good morning, everybody. It's a real privilege to be here among this distinguished gathering this morning to talk about a topic that we are really passionate about in community business, about diversity and inclusion. How many of you know about community business here? I expected that. One, two, oh, three, <laughs> OK. Well, I think we've been operating in a very low profile. Community Business is a not-for-profit organization that started in Hong Kong. It's headquartered in Hong Kong. Way back, this is actually our 20th year in existence. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's time that we came out and spoke a little louder about what the kind of work we do. And so I'm here today to do that. But typically, we work with organizations and individuals who want to drive diversity and inclusion in their workplaces. That's really what we do. And just to give an understanding, this is to create a positive impact on people and therefore for the society at large. And how do we do this? I mean, it sounds very cliche, but basically, we engage with leadership in organizations to ensure that they're able to drive this uh, change and bring in more responsible and inclusive business practices across. Uh, we also, you could come up in the front. <laughs> Uh, and we also uh, look at, you know, uh, most of the work we do is about reducing inequalities at the workplace. And, and you'll hear more of that as we go along. And I think that's the bulk of the work we do, whether it's on gender inequality, LGBT+, people with disability, and a lot more that falls under diversity today. We also work with organizations to ensure there's, uh, you know, social inclusion is happening in terms of, you know, uh, ensuring the marginalized, underrepresented groups have a voice. And, and of course, as everyone is doing today, but we've been uh, advocating this over many years in terms of promoting well-being at workplaces. So that's what we do. Our footprint is just to give you an idea. We just have physical offices in Hong Kong. And in India, we are present in Bangalore. But we actually have a footprint across. We are a very Asia-focused organization. We understand that diversity and inclusion pans out differently in different regions, and you really need to get a local market approach towards it. But our focus has always been Asia. I'd also want to quickly say that, like most organizations, community business is absolutely committed to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, uh, but in particular to these, 70, uh, to these five that we spoke about. When I speak to you about the SDG 17, I said we actually work with leadership in organizations. We partner with them to ensure that they're able to drive this change. They're able to bring in responsible and inclusive practices. And uh, when we talk about SDG 5 and SDG 10, that's really the bulk of the work we do in terms of reducing inequalities, in terms of uh, navigating that within organizations and ensuring that the employee network is completely sensitized. And when we talk about good health and uh, you know, well-being, it's not just about mental health and well-being that people talk about. We look at well-being holistically in terms of you know, physical well-being, emotional well-being, financial well-being, which became a big thing, especially from the pandemic times, and, and actually a work-life harmony. And uh, when, we, when we say that it is decent work and economic growth, it's really asking organizations to go beyond their own companies and to take these conversations to the society at large, wherein you actually look at a larger talent pool, provide equitable opportunities for uh, the social mobility to happen, and then there is socio-economic mobility in turn. A quick look now, uh, now that there is a bit of understanding in what community business does in India and across the region in Asia. I just wanted to understand. Right from yesterday, we've attended a lot of conversations here. It was on leadership in the new world of work. We attended sessions on coaching in the new world of work. I'd like to hear from the audience who probably, how many of you were present yesterday in, in various sessions? I, thank you. At least few hands went up. I'm, I'm sure there were more of you present. But what is your understanding of the new world of work? If I just have to ask you a question like that. What, what comes up to you as, a, as, a, in, as an immediate response when I say the new world of work? Because we are using this terminology regularly. I'd love to hear some responses. There's no right or wrong response. But what is it that comes up quickly when you say 
New world of work. What does the new world of work look like for you? People centric. Great. Yeah, sure. Balance. Balance. You want to elaborate on that a little? Fantastic. Prioritizing professional and your me time, personal life. Great. Any other, uh, what, what happened when we were going on referring to the new world of work? If somebody can just, uh, you know, anything else that comes up to anyone else? Hybrid. Hybrid, yes. Yeah, thank you. yeah sure. If someone wants to say, I don't know, you're waving to me. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I thought you're waving to me. Okay, yeah. Okay, so yeah, all of this is right and I would love to revisit. We said hybrid, we said balance in work and life and people-centric, all phenomenal responses. Thank you for that uh, because I'd love this to be more participative right through. Uh, so we'll revisit that part of it when we come back to new world of work. Let's try and understand what the Indian workforce looks like. All of us understand that India is extremely diverse as a country, right? We have multiple cultures, multiple ethnicities, multiple languages, religions, regions, uh, 1.3 plus billion population, an urban-rural divide. We talk about, uh, you know, I mean, there's so much uh, differences in uh, culture between the north and south, differences in terms of diet, in terms of food preferences. I think when we look at Asia as a region, there are such cultural nuances that exist pan-Asia. But India being the size it is, and India having such complexities, look at how many languages are spoken, right? So when we look at all of these complexities, I don't think there's any, any country in the world that can boast of such a diverse her heritage that we in India have. But despite this diversity, we all come with some shared values, which is Asian values and definitely from an Indian perspective. When we say shared values, we talk about respect, we talk about relationships, we talk about discipline, we talk about hard work, right? These are inherently there as an Asian, uh, you know, uh, value and definitely embedded strongly in the Indian ethos and the way we work. I mean, adherence to authority. This is all something that we add as a common shared value. And then there is these assimilation happens of these different cultures into a dominant culture that already is prevalent, which is also happening in a workforce, from a workforce perspective, right? And that is something that we call as racial hegemony, where a dominant culture prevails, which therefore actually takes you to marginalized groups and a bit of at different levels in organizations. So what should, uh, and then there is a bit of, uh, you know, some people say colonial hangover, I still like to say, uh, the Western influence in the way we think, talk, and the, the actual things that we need at a workforce. But what we ask organizations to think about right through is really to think about it from a perspective of giving a local market approach to diversity and inclusion. Because even within Asia, there are differences, there are nuances. And we say this because one of the main things we do as part of what we do in community business is our work is grounded in research. Over these 20 years that I said we are in existence, we actually brought in close to 20 different publications across all topics of diversity and inclusion. And, uh, you know, so we, we talk about topics and we nudge those conversations where people are scared to even venture right now. And we've been able to have these conversations with leadership in corporates because most of your workforce is there. And that's what we do. So a localized approach definitely helps. What do you think is the current business climate? I mean, this is a very self-explanatory uh, kind of a slide. And I think all of us have been speaking about it for the last uh, yesterday. I've heard many, many conversations across leadership and beyond where we're talking about how the pandemic has impacted. We all know that the pandemic had its challenges. We all had to look at what does workplace mean today? Is remote working here to stay? What are we doing in terms of work? And when we talk about pandemic, we also say that it had its impact not just in terms of work. In, it was a global phenomenon, right? It wasn't, but locally, while companies were gearing up to do a certain things, it had its impact overall on the country and the workplaces because you also had to say there was 
the, the slowdown in economic growth because of the inflation rates going up in China. And all of this had an impact. So people were already dealing with all the challenges that came up with pandemic, not just in terms of, uh, you know, taking care of lives as an immediate priority, taking care of workplaces as the second priority, but overall looking at all other aspects that came up with pandemic. While we are getting used to this work from home, remote working, there was this Ukraine war, which probably didn't have a direct impact across all organizations in India, but there were companies that were affected, either because they were present, they were having presence or some kind of uh, traction with the countries that were at war, or Indian families being present in these locations, and of course affecting, impacting trade industry because, you know, fuel prices going up, etc. The recent thing we hear is, you know, tech layoffs. I don't know how many of you are keeping track, but they're happening in huge numbers, right? And why are they happening? Because we hired in huge numbers because that was the need of the R during the pandemic because we had to change our work style. We had to change how we were working, what we were thinking, how we were going to work. So now we hear this, and there's anxiety that's created, right? Oh my God, I don't know who's next. So that's the buzzword that goes on. But who's really losing their jobs? What's actually happening? What kind of uh, labor was hired and for what jobs? So the deep dive is not happening, but there are anxious moments continuously for one reason or the other. And because of all of this, there's a shadow of recession that's there. It's not quite hit us yet, but constantly one is saying, are we going to be getting that now? What is the scene? What are we going to be looking at? But all I can tell you that the organizations that are investing in diversity and inclusion, the organizations that are listening to the needs of the employees are the ones that are going to survive in 2023. So this I can tell you with so much confidence because as part of what we do, we run a network called DIAN, which is an acronym for diversity and uh, India Asia Network, Inclusion Asia Network. And this has a lot of members who are individuals and organizations who become members. And we have these conversations where we share best practices. We understand what's happening in each other's organizations. And then we, they take these conversations back as learnings. So people who are listening to what the employee needs are, are the ones that will have some hope for 2023. Let's quickly look at an employee life cycle in the new normal. And here I'm going to pause and say, some of you have said, what's the new normal? Work-life balance in, in, in a short term, and that's what you spoke about. People-centric, so listening to people. There was nothing right or wrong in your answers, right? I mean, absolutely what we are saying. When you look at an employee life cycle, it actually begins right up front, even in, before you apply for a job. But I'm actually cutting a few stages and getting in from onboarding. What changed with pandemic, right? So we removed the human intervention completely. We were completely dependent on machines. And we said, this machine, this app is going to decide the fitment of this person for this job because I can't meet you. I don't know any other aspects of you right now. And that's what we did, right? That caused its own challenges in terms of understanding companies, the culture, the people. In terms of engagement also, this created problems because I mean, everyday operations, when you go into an office, I think was easy. If there's not X, there's Y, there's Z, that you can talk to and solve it then and there. But today, you had to be on a call. You had to check whether that other person, you don't know what they're doing because there were no structured timelines. And you had to then take it from there to see when that work was happening. So for new employees, this definitely posed a huge challenge. And there were blurred work-life balance, absolutely, because there was no structure of working 9 to 5, 9 to 8, whatever. I'm going to office at this time, coming back at this time. You didn't know when your work started and when your whole life started. And this was a stretch for many people. We saw that and we saw it especially when we speak about underrepresented and marginalized groups. And I'll address that a little later. And this led to new skill sets being learned. This is a funny one because when we talk about new skill sets, it's great to be learning. But I don't know how many of you in this place will remember, at one point of time when people were applying for jobs, the thing that they had to write is, are you, uh, you know, equipped with, with Microsoft Office, <laughs> right? And if you said you were excelling in Excel and you had very good PowerPoint skills, you were considered king. But today, 
that was just one part of it right we are constantly learning new skills we had to learn technology to talk to people through a screen we had to learn to talk to people or deliver big conferences and trainings not being able to get the emotions and understand how that's being received today if i am doing this in front of you i can actually see your expressions and get that and gauge that beautifully if i am seeing hundreds faces on the screen i don't know i only see it till here <laughs> and i don't know how i can actually gauge that right so so we had to unlearn a lot of what we learned while we had to keep learning what we are learning with a constant and this also had a spectrum of ageism being brought into it because uh, it's funny there was an article from the uh, in, in in times asia times about you know how we are actually looking at this kind of uh, you know uh, the great career reset that's happened post pandemic how are we looking at four generations at a workplace at the same time right how do we look at the needs of four generations at a workplace when you are actually talking about it in a remote sense so there were so much more challenges when you say in one sentence you can say new skills but to unlearn what you learned uh, more in terms of learning new skills and rapidly i think it's becoming a competition of man versus machine right we are, we are constantly looking at oh my god is this coming through ai is this going to take it away am i so the anxiety levels are picking up constantly for us to say am i in pace with this am i keeping pace with it am i two steps ahead or backward so what you've learned has become temporary what you need to learn is become constant and that's one thing that we learned when we talk about managing everyday performance i think it's clearly not about what were you doing but the focus was where are you doing it from and how are you solving it how are you doing it the question of how are you equipped to do something was the conversations that were people having in, in at their workplaces so do you have the i mean the infrastructure is there but do you have the know how to actually get that job done so the focus really shifted from what we are doing to how you are doing it and where you are doing it from and this actually the traditional systems of you know giving perks incentives to people do they hold good when you are saying people are working remotely and this is a conversation again that people are rethinking back in corporates how do we incentivize uh, teams how do we make teams grow when they are working in silos what is the understanding of team uh, management team uh, work when you are all sitting in different locations and how does this pan out and more importantly when i was speaking about you know a constant competition with machine today the shelf life of a job is shorter than the shelf life of an employee on the job and that's the reality right we are constantly saying i still have the energy to do this 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 but by the time you went to that there's already a new technology taking over there's already a new piece that's come over and you need to learn so it's become a cycle so when you think of this entire life cycle uh, that an employee is going through to ensure that you know he feels he or she feels secure we find that the workplace definition itself has changed right today we don't say we pass by an office i think we say this is my office building we don't say this is my workplace because you probably are not going there every day to work right and that's the reality so workplace has really shifted with focus on workspace and that's what we've all worked through it right now so let's look at the evolution of this new workspace workplace that we are talking about what did it do we spoke about all the challenges that employees have felt right so the challenge really was the impact was severely felt on well being i'm sure most of you in corporates here present here today will understand that there were huge investments commitment and time energy energy spent from organizations for focusing on the well being of employees especially because you're working in silos they were you know people were feeling lonely you know there's usual uh, walking catching up people beyond your teams on corridors or canteens cup of chai is were all missing it was all thrown out of window right suddenly you were stuck in this place where you are only talking to your immediate teams you're talking to your immediate peers you're getting that job done as a deliverable then you're out and and then you're doing something else so this became the norm for fairly long and 
good and bad, but well-being became a, a priority. Organizations had to redo their framework, rework on introducing policies which spoke about well-being. And for us, we do a lot of trainings, not just on uh, mental health and well-being. We actually run campaigns called This Is Me in India, as well as This Is Me across Asia, uh, where we speak about lived experiences to take away the stigma around mental health. But we take it a step further and actually roll out initiatives and corporates on physical well-being, the importance of emotional well-being, and financial well-being, which I said earlier, that was a huge challenge. And talk about work-life harmony, not just a balance. You know, how do you be get, you know, to meet this in your own terms, in your own space? Because you are choosing that, right? But we also saw an unequal impact on underrepresented communities. When I talk about underrepresented communities, I think the workforce index said, in gender during the pandemic, about 48% women felt very stretched compared to 37% of men, simply because of more caregiving responsibilities, parenting duties, household works, etc. And this is a reality, this is a static that's there, right? It is a st uh, statistic that's available out there. But it also had some positives. When you talk about people with disability and you talk about uh, people from the LGBT community, for the people with disability, there were lots of uh, conversations we had where they said they actually felt better because they didn't have to commute so much in terms of a physical disability, and this sort of helped them. When you talk about the LGBT plus community, there were a lot of people who also shared that aspect, saying they were feeling safe in their own environment and not feeling judged. Okay, So something to think about. And this was, but at the end of it, it didn't impact everybody at the same level, in the same manner. Different people went through different kinds of experiences through these changes that were happening in the uncertain world that we talk about. It had its own challenge with, in terms of employee data privacy. Working remotely, employees were always wondering about the data ethics. Is my data being collected, collated, and kept confidential in organizations? That was the first thing. And of course, from an organization's perspective, employees, are they using uh, you know, private laptops? Are things encrypted? Are we doing it in a different style? How is it? So I think it worked both ways inverse. But all of these challenges that I'm speaking to you about definitely led to uh, complete uh, you know, cost control. And we are, we are getting a bit of that impact today as we speak, right? And budgets are cut because we are spending. Because there were a lot of infrastructure costs, unforeseen infrastructure costs to set up people in their homes or wherever remotely. There were lots of costs on well-being, which is a good thing. But then you know, they had to cut corners. At the end of it, the question that I hear every single day from every other organization that we are hybrid work, is it here to stay, right? In my belief, for whoever I speak to, I think it is. Because uh, you know, when you say five-day work week today, it's become passing. People are saying, I'm, I'm productive. I may come for two days. I may come for three days. People want a mix of both. So I think uh, hybrid. But how tangible is this? How sustainable is it going to be? Is this going to be viable in the long run? Is what companies are actually talking about and conversations are going to that. And I think policy is being worked around sooner or later on how do we make this workable and, uh, and a win-win because you finally have to listen to your employees. And the final aspect of all of this was inclusion versus belonging, right? We all talk about rolling out initiatives and you know, we made this, we did this, we did that to make it inclusive. But have we done enough to ensure those inclusive initiatives have actually converted into belonging, belongingness for employees? So for me, when I talk to corporates, I hear that corporates are being very sensitive to this. They're actually uh, using inclusive language. And they're, they're wanting to hear the needs of the employees making them feel more accepted, acknowledged, and welcomed. This is something that corporates are having to do constantly. right? They're using inclusive terminologies. They're improving their vocabulary to use pronouns. Most of you must be actually looking at that and saying, everybody's email today almost, I get a pronoun, which was unheard of even a few, few you know, one, two years ago. This has become a commonality today. right? We're also looking at internal communication becoming better. 
internal communication becoming better because uh, in terms of how to make it more inclusive, how to ensure that the inclusive initiatives have been accepted and the employees are feeling heard and therefore they are now participating in your initiatives to the extent that you want to see and that's inclusion versus belonging. So coming to this important slide, the future of the new world of work. We all spoke, I mean, all of you agreed when I spoke rather, that inclusive leadership is where we get started, right? We want leaders to walk the talk, to spend resources, time, money, energy, in actually driving these initiatives. Because it has to be a top-down approach today for it to become a bottoms-up approach at some point of time to meet up, right? And that's what we're saying. So engaging leaders to actually walk the talk, to provide equitable opportunities to, and to extend this uh, talent pool across beyond your organizations so that you're actually reaching out to people beyond and to the society at large and that would see a social mobility and will automatically improve the socio-economic diversity that we are talking about. There is definitely a culture of innovation, right? Fostering innovation is something that we are doing. But it shouldn't be man versus machine. It should be man thinking a few steps ahead of the machine. And how can corporates be a step ahead to say, this is not an anxious thing, but this is something that works for you, right? And therefore, along with innovation, I'll say that digitalization is here to stay. We're all actually benefiting from it in many ways in our day-to-day -day existence, right? Because of the apps that are there, we, we, our lives have become much simpler. But how do we use this in the work phrase that we are not competing, but we are complementing each other and actually without the man, the machine is nothing and we are those few steps ahead, constantly skilling, learning and, you know, relearning things that we did. And building engagement and trust is, of course, creating the space of psychological safety. And I think you all have heard of, the, of that a lot from yesterday. I think it onus is not just in the leadership, of course it starts there, but all of us in our own right can create safe places where everybody feels that they can bring their whole selves to work. That's an important aspect of inclusion, right? And we did this in our uh, conversations with many corporates, even by rephrasing their self-identification questionnaires. <laughs> we find that you ask them questions and they're always wondering how come they don't come out with the actual answers. But if you actually look at it, and say, you know, this is what it needs to be asked as. And there's been tremendous progress after that because you're not interrogating. You're making them feel comfortable to come out and express who they are. So I think that's an important part. Nurturing an environment of belonging, and I already said, I think the need of the R is to listen to your employees. It's no longer about, I'm, we have this culture you need to fit in. We have this culture we want you to fit in. Tell us what we can do to make you become part of this culture. And I think that's the process it's going. What's not here and what I'd like to leave a bit of thinking is also about what is the future looking like, right? One aspect is I think the term diversity has expanded. The term diversity has expanded to add additional uh, forms of diversity like neurodiversity, cognitive diversity, social mobility, socioeconomic diversity. These are all important topics of conversation today in corporates all across. And so when you talk about a diverse workforce and for a diverse workforce to create the creativity, that's an important aspect for leaders to think about for the future. Are we still restricting ourselves to the two, three topics that we talk about and say we are a very diverse and inclusive organization or are we taking it beyond with an intersectional lens across every other topic that we talk about to include all of this in terms of diversity and inclusion. The other thing I would like to leave with all of you today before I wind up for today is to say that I think when we talk about measuring success, we measure diversity which is quantitative, right? We're all able to measure it beautifully saying this many numbers of gender, this much percentage of uh, pe people with disability, or we are looking at becoming from X to Y in, in this time span and stuff because it's quantitative. I think what is important for the future from this year, especially with the climate that we're in, is how are we measuring inclusion? It's qualitative. The analysis is qualitative. So 
I think we all need to understand how do we actually spend time as leadership to measure inclusion for us to take that step forward. On that note, I'm going to end here and happy to take questions. Thank you so much for being such a wonderful audience. Hi, uh, this is Roshni. I would like to know from you that uh, with the you know, companies that you are involved with, how much uh, do you think the corporates have woken up to well-being and wellness as an integral part of an ongoing process for the employees and not just a one of uh, you know, calling somebody once a year and having to talk about it? Thank you, Roshni. A phenomenal question. Thank you so much. I mentioned in a brief way that, you know, we, we do something called the This Is Me campaign, right, in, in, for our members. So even before the pandemic, we were focused on working with our uh, members in terms of, you know, promoting and removing the stigma around mental health because it was becoming a topic. But during the pandemic, we saw that it went to a completely different level. And we saw, actually, we, between the region and India, we have about 75 odd companies as our Diane members. And we are growing, right? Across this, I can say that this became a priority in terms of investment, which made us start looking at initiatives and rollouts for all other aspects of well-being that I spoke to you about in terms of financial well-being. Because uh, I don't know if many of you saw an ad in LinkedIn recently when, you know, when we talk about gender equality, suddenly financial equality, people said, zero knowledge, right? Who buys your car? Not me. I drive it, <laughs> you know. But I make choices and everything else, but I don't really, I leave the choice of my financial investments to my family or my husband or my brother or my father. I'm not involved, you know. So it came from a gender equality aspect, but we're trying to tell people, you need to know your financial health. We are talking about physical well-being in a big way because it's so important, right? It's not just about one or the other. So to answer your question, I think companies have become a lot more committed in terms of well-being initiatives because we run these programs. We see we have, they have dedicated counselors recruited. They are allowing people to go and have conversations. Uh, so I think there's a lot happening in this space. Thanks for your uh, you know, understanding through your initiative community business, um, not just only gender diversity, what are the other diversities also people are practicing socio-economic and also Absolutely. Uh, physical enabled, uh, enabled uh, physical people disabled with people disability, yeah. and also economic diversity yeah. and inclusive initiatives, how is this? So thank you, thank you for that. So, like I, I think you missed the beginning that I said, so sorry if I'm being repetitive to the rest of the audience, but we are a 20-year-old uh, company started in Hong Kong. So, while we started with gender diversity, and I don't know, we still talk about gender diversity in some organizations at different levels, and I think that will never go, but we are talking not just about hiring gender at a particular level, but we are taking it to a different spectrum altogether in terms of self-branding, image building, we're talking about women in leadership, women on boards, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not all that we do. All across, if you go into what we do, we've got publications based on our work because we have access to a wealth of information because of all the corporates that we work with through our network called Diane and Diane India. So we have this wealth of information. And we do research. You know, I have uh, <laughs> the right behind you who was a contributor for the religious diversity that we brought out three years ago. We brought in neurodiversity as a conversation just last year. This year, we are bringing trans inclusion at the workplace as a research piece. Because we don't believe in working only with the members who've subscribed to us, but these <coughs> research publications go out to the larger society. Anyone who gets into our website can download it, read it, practice it. So the impact, therefore, for us is to take it beyond organizations. Talking about social mobility, we are in conversations in developing those models for many organizations today. So, like I said, the concept of diversity has broadened today. We are not just talking about LGBTQ plus rights. We, are, we will have those conversations. We will continue to have those conversations. It's not one or the other, but I think the other is something that's becoming a larger piece of the cake today. We are including cognitive diversity, out-of-the-box thinking. When you talk about it, unless you have neurodivergent talent, people who have got other aspects of it. And we have many organizations who've embraced this, 
who hired this talent in Bikri, right? So we are working.